Hello, everyone. Welcome back from our lunch break. And for those of you who weren't able to attend in the morning, welcome to our belonging and difference colloquy. I just have a few notes up here so that you know that the webinar is being recorded. Um, please keep your audio muted if you're not speaking. You have a question and answer feature. And during this second session, if you have questions for the speakers, um, go ahead and type those in the Q&A. And after the individual speakers have given their presentations, um, I'll direct those questions to them. And we also, if you wanna look at the schedule or get more information on the speaker's bios, those are available um, as you can see on the screen. I'm Kristen Kalsom, uh, co-director of the Nathaniel R. Jones Center for Race, Gender, and Social Justice. And I am delighted to be the moderator of our second panel of the day, our first one of the afternoon. Um, we brought together a group of scholars who work on a wide array of topics, kind of under this umbrella of belonging and difference. And it was important to us that this be truly interdisciplinary. And interdiscipline is something I think that's thrown around sometimes too loosely in the academy. Um, it sounds good, everyone wants us to do interdisciplinary work, but the three scholars who are on this panel this afternoon are truly interdisciplinary scholars, bringing out the best that can happen when you're able to break down some of those barriers that we were talking about earlier in the morning, those silos in which sometimes our disciplines can uh, trap us in or um, in which to speak authoritatively, we're supposed to do that within a certain discipline. So um, I'm delighted to hear what um, the three scholars who are on this panel have to say on their different topics. We're gonna go in a little different order here um, because uh, Professor Aziz has been slightly delayed. So I hope this is okay um, with Karee Polk if I'm going to start um, with his presentation followed by Chandra Frank and then um, Professor Aziz will go last. Dr. Karee Polk um, is an associate professor of Black Studies and Sexuality and Women's and Gender Studies at Amherst College. He's a cultural historian of the African American diaspora, a specialist in LGBTQ studies, and a scholar of race, gender, and sexuality in the US military. Just to give you a taste of the different kinds of intersections that we're going to be exploring today. Chandra Frank is a postdoctoral fellow here. We're lucky to have her at the University of Cincinnati. She is a feminist researcher and a curator, and she works at the intersections of archives, waterways, gender, sexuality, and race. And her perspectives on this idea of belonging and difference are going to um, come from very interesting places. Waterways is not one of the ways that I have explored these issues before. I'm very excited. And then wrapping up our panel will be Professor Sahara Aziz, who is a professor of law, but she's an interdisciplinary scholar who examines work at the intersections of security, race, and rights in both the U.S. context and transnational context. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And Dr. Polk, are you okay going first? Sure. Okay, wonderful. Then I am going to turn this over to you. All right, and I hope it'll be okay if I can share my screen. Uh, yeah, you, you should be able to. All right, so let's... Yes, okay. we can see it. Thank you so much. Uh, so first, thank you all so much for the invitation to share work uh, in this forum. And this is uh, new work. Uh, so it's uh, definitely a work in progress. And, uh, and I appreciate all forms of comments and critiques. Um, I, at the moment, this project is tentatively uh, titled African and Atlantic Feminist Lives. Um, and 
this is a, a way of thinking about how Africa itself is sometimes left out of uh, the African diaspora. Uh, and so attempting to think through some of these issues uh, and the different intersections. Uh, and so bringing that together. But again, it's something I'm not, I'm not necessarily wedded to. Uh, and so I appreciate uh, people's help as I, as I try to think through uh, questions that the archive uh, uh, continue to uh, make me think, think about in different ways. In September 1946, in Berlin, Germany, the African-American writer, William Gardner Smith, interviewed a striking black woman, a woman who, quote, seemed out of place among the German blondes, brunettes, and redheads, end quote, frequenting one of the US Army enlisted clubs in the occupied city. Smith served in the US Army as an occupation soldier in post-war Germany. Alongside his everyday military duties, he also worked a side hustle as a special correspondent to the Pittsburgh Courier, the black newspaper made famous for its promotion of the Double V campaign during the war, and a paper he had also worked at as, high, as a high school student before being drafted into service. Smith's assignment as a clerk typist in Berlin gave him direct access to the former tools of his trade. And as a special correspondent to the Courier, he wrote a slew of articles that detailed the injustices faced by black soldiers in Germany, the covert attempt to purge them from overseas service and their reluctance to return to the United States. But even among the many articles he wrote for the Courier's readership back home in Philadelphia, this story was unique. Rather than offer another anti-racist critique of US Army policy in Germany, Smith channeled his fascination with this tall and well-dressed black woman into a feature story. Here, he wrote, she stood out like an orchid in a field of gardenias. She was something rare, something to be sought after, end quote. The woman in question, identified in, in print as Madeleine Guber Goodwin, had been born in Berlin, and her presence in Germany was, for Smith, something of a mystery. So the American Negroes want to know about the German Negroes, she said. Very well, I will tell you what I can. Speaking in German, Goodwin told Smith that she worked in the city as an entertainer. And before the war, she had traveled all over Europe. In fact, Goodwin came from a family of performers. Her father immigrated from Togo in 1896 to take part in the German colonial exhibition at Treptow Park in Berlin. Decades later, during the Nazi regime, she performed in a family trapeze act as the five Bozambos at the Deutsche Afrika Show, an updated human zoo meant to showcase the benevolence of German, Germany's colonial rule. After surviving World War II, Goodwin married an African-American soldier during the occupation period, took his last name, and as soon as she was able, planned to move with her husband and daughter to live in the United States. Taking a long drag from her cigarette, she told Smith bitterly, I have learned to hate the Nazis. While African-American GIs routinely describe service in Germany as a quote unquote breath of freedom in comparison to life in, in segregated Jim Crow United States, Goodwin made the decision informed by her experience under Nazi rule that she would rather immigrate to the US than remain in Germany. 
before the war, Goodwin estimated that there were perhaps 2,000 Afro-Germans in all of Germany, and most were, like herself, entertainers. Quote, Negroes set the style and clothes for Germany, she said. Everyone followed their pattern of dress. Her father was African and her mother was German. And Goodwin grew up as the youngest of five in her family, which lived in the neighborhood of North Hoon. Because there were so few blacks in Germany, she said, her family lived well for a time. But once the Nazi regime came into power, all of this changed. Life became very different, Goodwin said. Once the Nazis brought their theories of racial superiority, things became bad. We were scorned as semi-apes. We were insulted on the streets. We could not work in factories. Such a thing is crazy. The point of no return for, for Goodwin involved uh, one of her close girlfriends, uh, also Afro-German, who had been sterilized by the state. Her friend had fallen in love with a white German man, and the couple wanted to marry but were denied by Nazi authorities. Then, she said, one day the police came to her house and took the girl to a hospital. She was told by the medical authorities that it was feared she might bear a German child, but the child wouldn't be an Aryan. So they performed an operation on her. Now she can never have a child, end quote. Because Goodwin's father held French nationality, the American authorities gave her permission to marry an American soldier. I think I'd like to go to America, she said pensively. And Smith noted how her eyes lit up. Quote, after so many years under, not under the Nazis, I think that would be a paradise. From the books I've read and from what I've heard people say, everyone is treated exactly the same there, regardless of race." End quote. With that statement, Smith ended Goodwin's profile bluntly. She didn't see me smile. Smith treated her lack of knowledge of, about American racism with derision and dismissed her dreams of freedom in his own native land forthright. Yet, he was so taken by Goodwin's persona and experiences that he chose to interpolate her life story into his novel, Last of the Conquerors, which came out in 1948. The thinly veiled portrait of his experiences as an African-American soldier in a trucking company in occupied Berlin gained him, him great acclaim. And in recent years, it has received renewed critical in interest, especially from feminist historians of the German-American post-war military encounter. <laughs> its protagonist, Hayes Dawkins, an African-American soldier in Berlin, is told about the existence of Layla, an Afro-German dancer who worked in theater and clubs before the war. Like Madeleine Guber Goodwin, Layla was also waiting for her American soldier boyfriend to send for her to come to America. As Hayes' girlfriend Ilsa attests, quote, Layla was born in Berlin and then went to many countries in Europe to dance. She speaks so many languages, darling. You should hear her. Negroes, I didn't know they were here, Hayes exclaims. With the same amazement that characterized Smith's assessment of Goodwin's uncanny presence in Germany, fracturing the author's own middle, middle passage epistemology that was loath to understand black being and belonging as anything other than American, and as anything other than a product of transatlantic slavery. <coughs> Excuse me. In the epilogue uh, to my book, Contagions of Empire, I offer a brief examination of William Gardner Smith's tour of duty in Berlin. And I argue that his witness 
as subject and scribe of the overseas military apparatus, offered a counter history to America's official military record of occupation. His communiques and literary reflections of the American uh, occupation still stand today as a singular record of the fervor of that disorienting and discomforting moment for black soldiers, reifying their experiences into protest and prose and continuing a tradition of black military critique that had been, I argue, centuries in the making. As it stands, the contemporary historiography of African-American military service has played a vital role in documenting the black struggle for civil rights at home and abroad. And in so doing, it has helpfully reimagined the black soldier as a black international and has taken seriously the ways race, gender, sexuality, and citizenship have been negotiated within the contact zones of American militarism. Yet I would also suggest that the relative lack of critical inquiry into, into black military life overseas has led it to fixate upon the freedom dreams of heterosexual men. In doing so, it has inadvertently trafficked in a heteronormative discourse of manhood rights, whereupon the demonstration of a particular form of masculinity, martial courage, courage for example, entitles the black male subject to rights and privileges of citizenship. All of this said, I must admit that uh, like Smith, I too remain fascinated by the figure of Madeline Goober Goodwin. The rakish angle of her hat positioned just so atop her head. The fur lined lapels of her embroidered coat and the familiarity of her, uh, of her slide, excuse me, and the familiar, familiarity of her smile and her diasporic family history of colonial performance in the 1890s through to the 1930s. Her personal witness to the sterilization of black Germans during the Nazi regime. All of these things make Goodwin an incredibly alluring historical figure. To me, the Afro-German African-American encounter as chronicled by Smith carries the possibility of anti-colonial and anti-racist solidarity within overlapping Western imperial archives. The kinds of encounters that have been known to occur in the contact zones of American militarism um, as possibilities of belonging forged in the ruins of occupied Berlin. Smith's European service ended on January 21st, 1947, and he arrived in the New York Harbor on the SS Marine Robin uh, that February. During his return voyage, he took time to reflect upon the paradoxical feelings of freedom and constriction he experienced as an occupation soldier in Berlin and began working on his novel soon after. The success of Last of the Conquerors paved the way for his own permanent immigration uh, from the United States, um, where and then he moved to France, where he lived for two decades before dying in Paris in 1974. And what of the figure of Madeleine Guber Goodwin, whose encounter with fascism in Germany gave her the conviction to expatriate? With the research assistant of Regetta Rice and Kim Everett, two friends of mine in Berlin, I learned that Goodwin did in fact immigrate from Germany in 1947 to the United States on the USS General Noir with her daughter Persian uh, in tow. What's more, Brigetta, who is a crackerjack genealogist, discovered that the transliteration of Madeline's surname was incorrect. Instead of Guber, it was in fact Garber. And with that information, she was able to substantiate the claims made, uh, uh, that the claims Madeline made about her family, her birthplace, 
and her role as a member of the Five Zambos and the Deutsch African, uh, Africa show, uh, complete with play playlist uh, for the Garba Schwester, uh, uh, or Garba uh, Geschwester, or the Garba brothers and sisters. Madeline Goodwin moved to Buffalo, New York with her husband, Jack, and became a naturalized US citizen. Uh, after he died, uh, she remarried in 1958 and lived the rest of her very long life in Buffalo, dying in 2013 at the age of 94. So to return to the theme of belonging and difference uh, that marks today's conference, I remained amazed by the possibilities and potentials of diasporic kinship produced in the wake of overlapping militarisms. That the creative use of difference can usefully destabilize our understandings of race, gender, and national origin. At the very least, Smith's death in Paris and Goodwin's in Buffalo necessarily complicates who and what we mean when we speak of African-American in the aggregate as an imagined community forged in the fire of chattel slavery and not, for example, through the kilns of colonialism. Swaths of Madeleine Garber's life intersect with canonical texts of Afro-German history. And here I'm thinking of the multi-authored Barbara Buchanan, Showing Our Colors, Afro-German uh, Women Speak Out, Robbie uh, Aitkins and uh, Eve Rosenhoff's Black Germany, The Making and Unmaking of a Diaspora Community, 1884 to 1960, Tina Kampf's Other Germans, as well as Tiffany Florville's Mobilizing Black Germany. I have to say that I fer fervently disagree with William Gardner Smith's insinuation that Garber was naive to believe that she might uh, have a better life for herself and her family in the United States. Her choice doesn't read as naivete to me. I see it as courageous. The fact that she decided to take her chances on life in the US, uh, in, on life in the US uh, Jim Crow North only enriches what we might understand as the vicissitudes of the Black European experience. And once the whole of her story is told, may in fact offer us new additional models for understanding how African-American feminist subjects negotiated race, gender, sexuality, and nation in a long 20th century marked by displacement, war, and migration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karee. I don't know why I couldn't unmute myself, but <laughs> that's wonderful. I'm so excited that we have left a half an hour at the end of this session to have a question and answer so that we can come back to your fascinating characters in your, in your talk here. But at this point time, I'd like to move on to Chandra Frank, who will give her presentation and so R has arrived, so she'll go after. And then all of you, if you have questions that you are thinking of as the presentations are going on, feel free to put them in the Q&A session now. And I'll turn it over to Chandra. You're muted, Chandra. There, now, now you're unmuted. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you. So I'd like to thank the organizers for this wonderful event and for the insightful conversation so far. I'm not going to touch my computer again so that I don't get accidentally muted or unmuted. Um, so today I want to think about belonging and difference through the feminist and queer Black migrant and refugee movement in the Netherlands. 
Um, and so I won't actually be speaking about waterways um, today, but it's something that um, is very much included in my ongoing research and book project. So I'm, I'm happy to, um, to talk about that in, in the discussion afterwards. So part of why I'm interested in talking about the Black Migrant and Refugee Movement, which I will call BMR after this, um, is because they, the movement played such a critical role in the formation of knowledge production of race, gender, sexuality, coloniality, and migration. Um, and similar to some of what we've heard today in the German context, there is an absolute lack of knowledge production within the Dutch context, um, but also obviously in, in broader knowledge production on feminist and queer movements of color and the work that they have done to generate knowledge on um, belonging and difference. So just to give you a little bit of context, the BMR movement was active between the late 1970s and early 2000s. Um, the name of the movement is actually a reflection of migrants coming to the Netherlands from the former colonies such as Suriname, the Dutch Antilles, Indonesia, as well as labor migrants who came from Turkey, Morocco, and countries surrounding the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea, and later refugee women from countries um, such as Somalia, Afghanistan, Eritrea, um, and several countries in South America. So the BMR movement in terms of its knowledge production and solidarity politics offers such an important insight into how race and gender and racism operates in the Netherlands. Um, and I've just included a couple of key publications um, that were predominantly came out during the 80s um, and some continued into the 90s. Um, but I'll specifically be focusing um, on Flamboyant today, which is um, the newsletter you see in the middle of the slide. So the very name of the movement, Black Migrant and Refugee, brings up attention even during the height of its use. So using the term BMR is conflicting for several reasons. Um, perhaps the most obvious and straightforward one is that the use of the term in present day feels outdated. After all, who in the Netherlands falls neatly within these proposed categories? And um, we're currently talking about fourth generation um, of migrants. So one of the questions I'm asking is, were BMR women even able to fully mobilize these categories in self-organization? Um, and in which ways were these categories used to figure out um, the politics of belonging and difference. So I ask these questions not so much um, today to, to see conclusive answers, but to explore the complexities that come with political self-organization. So in the early stages of the movement, um, women predominantly organized under the framework of political blackness. So even though the name referred to black migrant and refugee, um, the movement very much adopted the political framework of political, uh, the framework of political blackness. And so the term likely traveled from the UK to the Netherlands um, and was understood to be particularly apt to speak to post-colonial migrants. So this very concept um, speaks to the importance of thinking through the complex positionalities held by labor migrants and post-colonial migrants within the Dutch context. The term has always received important scrutiny in terms of its limitations and uh, the inability to address the specificity of anti-Blackness within a Dutch colonial context. And I raise this here to offer insight into how from a very early start, the Amar women were thinking through belonging and difference in relationship to diaspora. So these modes of travel of ideas, concepts, and people bring into focus the long histories of diasporic exchange that underlie the BMR movement. The BMR movement addressed structural inequalities in education, policy, culture, and politics. And within this broader movement, full num numerous smaller groups informed by ethnicity, sexuality, language, and culture. Subjected to right wing um, politics and anti black and anti migrant sentiments and an exclusionary white feminist movement in the 1980s, we see that BMR women feel compelled to organize across ethnicities. So women coming together in their living rooms, around kitchen tables, setting up radio stations, magazines, founding their own artistic and political collectives, um, and setting up national days of Black women friendship. So what I'm interested in teasing out today is how belonging and difference play out in some of the organizational politics of the movement, as well as in the making of archives. Specifically, I'll be talking about flamboyance. Um, 
the very first archive and documentation center set up in Amsterdam in the 1980s. Founded by feminist and queer women, the center set out to be uh, a meeting place, a site of study, um, and an archival site to find information about the Amar women. So the name of the organization was chosen carefully and carries multiple connotations. I quote, Flamboyant is the most beautiful ornamental tree of the tropics. The tree gets about 20 meters high and has wavering leaves like an acacia and blooms beautiful flowers. When in bloom, the tree looks flaming hot, hence its name. Contrary to other please, trees, plants from the tropics that are known as Dutch house plants, the ficus and hibiscus, the flamboyant has not been tamed and would prefer to die instead of shrink in the Dutch living room. Um, this, end of quote. this is a quote from uh, one of the flamboyant newsletters and it's an explanation behind the name. So I was moved by this explanation the founders gave their collective, um, especially the emphasis placed on the refusal to be tamed and shrunk within the Dutch living room. The stories coming out of Flamboyant demonstrate the need to center different histories of empire and displacement. What stands out about Flamboyant is how they interweave feminist, lesbian, anti-racist politics at once, thereby offering important insights into solidarity and coalition building practices. So I want to share a couple of examples with you. So first, Flamboyant refused to organize along the lines of ethnicity and to stick to uh, non-political activities such as arts and crafts, which was expected by the Amsterdam municipality. This refusal should be seen in relationship to the failure of the Dutch government, which didn't know whether to place feminists and queer migrants of color under the category migrant or the category woman, which led to a discrepancy in policy. The flamboyant women used this experience to rethink intersectionality within a Dutch context and started to use the term kruispuntdenke or thinking from the crossroads to speak to this intersectional failure. So this is just like one of the reasons why a diasporic feminist analysis is really important. Having migrants organized within their own pillars was a strategy used to keep BMR women depoliticized. Pillarization was a common feature in Dutch society between 1900 and 1960 and referred to, and I quote, segmentation of society into religious and secular blocks and subcultures. In the development of what was called multicultural policy, which was focused on the integration of quote unquote ethnic minorities, the Dutch government deemed it unnecessary for migrants to organize across ethnicities. I understand this tactic of pillarization as a refusal to allow for political intimacy to emerge between migrants of color. Flaboyan, recognizing the currency in racial intimacy, started to organize workshops, conferences, and cultural production geared towards coalition building. For instance, political debates were held on the position of migrant sex workers, seminars on the lack of access to healthcare services, and workshops on writing feminist literature. These modes of organizing were geared towards breaking the divisions implemented by the Dutch state. In situating this politics of refusal as a mode of political resistance, Flamboyant underscribed the need to have a library and a documentation center in order to further politicize BMR women. Flamboyant felt that true solidarity work would not be possible without access to different modes of knowledge production, without access to materials by and for migrants of color. Flamboyant set itself the task to become the first documentation center um, that cater to the needs of BMR women. The Dutch government responded to funding requests by questioning the need for BMR women to have access to literature and stated that surely there would be relevant literature and materials in white feminist archives, public libraries, university and state libraries for black women. Flamboyant conducted its own research and found that the experiences of migrants of color were not accounted for in public information services. Where terms and materials pertaining to migrants or black people were available, it was solely about the so-called then third world. In other words, BMR experiences were rendered geographically illegible within existing Dutch archives. So there's a larger question here about how archival structures play a role in the politics of difference and belonging, especially when we think about how we chart genealogies of already marginalized feminist, marginalized feminist and queer histories of color.
So within this context, I'm specifically thinking about white feminist archives and the ways in which the racial taxonomies of archives tell us something about the intended users. And so the irony is not lost in me that I was doing archival research into flamboyant at a white feminist archive while reading the materials um, about the conversations that they were having and the exchanges with the Dutch government about setting up their own archives. In 1991, Flamboyant lost the funding battle because the center had become too intellectual, according to the Amsterdam municipality. For the Dutch, integration was focused on silent participation and adhering to Dutch cultural norms and values. With defiant political organization, solidarity practice, and collective study, Flamboyant posed a threat as they exceeded the purpose of integration. Finally, I want to briefly come back to the metaphor of the Flamboyant tree. The flamboyant women use this metaphor to speak to the refusal of the tree to shrink and be tamed within the Dutch living room. For flamboyant, the refusal to be tamed and to shrink becomes this embodied practice. The Dutch living room is the epitome of integration and speaks to competing notions of belonging. The shrinking and taming are directly articulated in, in reference to the expectation of the Dutch nation state to fit into the white normative order. So I want to end here with a couple of questions um, that I'm grappling with. And I should mention that this, this part of my research on flamboyant um, is part of uh, my current book project. Um, so I want to think what happens when we theorize belonging and difference from a Dutch perspective within a transnational framework, um, especially because the BMR movement is already so transnational and diasporic in nature um, by virtue of the histories of migration in the Dutch context, but as well as, as I've laid out, because it was a, a politics of refusal and resistance to actually say, oh, the Dutch state uh, as a state in keeping us separate, what would happen if we would collaborate across ethnicities? Which is not to say that that was always easy, which is also not to say that that, that history should be romanticized. Um, but it's important to, to analyze this specific history from a transnational and diasporic um, framework. So I'm interested in, in, in what that means. And in addition, um, the BMR movement was also known to have close connections uh, with black, black feminists in the US, such as Audre Lorde, um, Alice Walker, Bell Hooks actually came to speak at Flamboyant as well. Um, but also feminists in the Caribbean, in South Africa and Latin America. So there, there are important connections um, that existed throughout the 80s, throughout the 90s, um, that are hardly part of um, the knowledge production when it comes to feminist and queer histories of color within a Dutch and US context. So another question that I'm asking is what intimacies with other imperial histories emerge um, through excavating some of these stories? And finally, in which ways do feminist and queer movements undo heteronormative readings of belonging and difference? Um, so specifically, Flamboyam is an important example because within their anti-racist feminist politics, um, it was an assumption that lesbian women, even if they identify as, as lesbian or not, um, would organize together with um, straight women. And those categories weren't as, as separated as within the white Dutch feminist movement, which had a very uh, distinct mode of organizing for lesbian women and feminist women. And so to kind of complicate how these histories are told, um, you know, what, what can we gain from feminist and queer approaches to, uh, to the archive, as well as to how we read belonging and difference. So I'm going to leave it here, um, but as I said, I'm happy to pick up any of these questions um, or anything related to waterways in the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chandra. I didn't mean to put you on the spot about the waterways. It's just too fascinating. We will definitely talk about it before the end of the day, but um, I'm happy to. What you were just speaking about also is so contributing to this topic in an interesting way. So we are going to um, move on to Professor 
Aziz, who will round out our presentation part of this panel. But as I said, I'm looking really forward to the um, Q&A, which will happen afterwards. So um, please put your questions in the Q&A section for me, um, for any of the speakers as you think of them. So welcome, Sahar. So good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you all for inviting me. This is such an important topic and one that is certainly lends itself to an interdisciplinary conversation. So those of you um, who, who may not know what I do, I'm a, a law professor and I know there are different disciplines, professors from different disciplines here. So the lens through which I look through tends to be the law, although I, I will try something, I will mix it up a little bit because as a hobby, I like poetry. Uh, which is not, I don't go to law school if you want, if you want to be that type of creative, it tends to be more the, the different side of the brain. Um, but as I was reading the literature, I just thought, I think I'm going to write a poem and then I'm going to talk more like a legal scholar. So bear with me. Belonging, to be, to long for, to long to belong in a space where one feels safe, wanted, Normal? Who is normal? Is to belong to be normal? Who decides who is normal? Who sets the norm? For you, for me, for us, but for us to exist, there must be a them. So does belonging axiomatically require exclusion, boundaries, insiders, outsiders, us and them? Belonging, a word in every culture's lexicon a word whose definition is rarely questioned. You know it when you feel it, when you feel dignity, equality, respect, you belong. The affective component of belonging, however, can blind you to the material consequences of belonging, though the two cannot be disconnected. So what do we mean to belong? More importantly, what do we want it to mean? In the realm of law, we look at evidence that is beyond the affective. The easiest and most reductivist definition is citizenship. Your passport officially declares that you belong to this nation, this geography, this culture, this people. The piece of paper is frail and meaningless. Unless you say we are equal, we both belong, right? Separate schools, separate neighborhoods, separate experiences in the same nation with the same passport, the same citizenship, so we both belong. Wrong. But we all have the same rights under the law, don't we? The U.S. Constitution applies to all of us. The law protects all of our civil rights. Isn't it enough to belong for everyone in the same geographical space defined by artificial borders to be a collective us? No, a resounding no, cries George Floyd when he begs for his life as the white police officer murders him under his knee. No, a resounding no, Eric Garner cries when he begs for his life as the white police officer chokes him to death. No. A resounding no proclaims the Muslims who cannot see their spouses, mother, father, and children banned from setting foot on U.S. soil, banned from soiling our soil with their very presence. No, a resounding no, say the majority of black and brown children in public schools significantly under-resourced as compared to their white counterparts across the country. They all have citizenship, but maybe, just maybe, if you behave yourself the way we want you to behave, just maybe we will grant you the permission to belong, conditionally, revocably. But the first rule, English only, we are a reasonable people, for we make exceptions to our rules. In this case, only upper middle class people of European origin may speak other languages. 
for that makes them competitive in the neoliberal global capitalist economy. But no Spanish for Mexican Americans, no Arabic for Arab Americans, no Urdu for Pakistani Americans, no Hindi for Indian Americans. English only, or else you have betrayed this nation. You have decided that you do not want to belong. So you can't blame us for making you part of them. And while we're on the topic of blame, how dare you come to our country, the land of the free, the home of the brave, and criticize it? Our criticism is constitutionally protected dissent, patriotic, that your dissent is treasonous, disloyal, and your decision that you do not want to belong. We let you in, and this is how you thank us? By speaking these foreign languages we cannot understand, eating these foreign foods that we cannot digest, wearing these foreign clothes, using foreign names we cannot pronounce. This is how you thank us. By threatening our identity, our hegemonic culture as we define it. If you want to belong, you cannot be different from us. We can be different among ourselves because there is no question that we belong, but you must constantly persuade, convince, prove that you belong every day with every word, with every action. Assimilate, emulate, copy, be the same as us. We don't care where you came from, for we are proudly a nation of immigrants, but we most certainly care how you behave, look, talk, eat, and live now that you are here. Now that you want to belong here with us, you must accept us as superior, smarter, more beautiful, and more civilized. America is the land of belonging, to be, to long for opportunity, the pursuit of happiness, but can you belong without dignity? Can you belong without legal rights that apply only to some in practice? Can you belong when your very skin color reminds the powerful of your difference? Belonging is identity. Who am I and where do I belong? So that is the poem I dedicate to belonging and difference. And now I will turn on my professorial hat <laughs> and talk a little bit about how these kind of broader norms or broader um, concepts apply to Muslims, Arabs, and South Asians, which is diasporas in particular in the US, which is what I focus on. So first, and I kind of, I want to bring it, I want to look at three different areas, citizenship, religion, and political rights. So with regard to citizenship, as many of us know, based on the history of our highly racialized immigration laws, until 1965, well, I think it was 19, actually 54, you could not be a US citizen, you cannot naturalize as a US citizen unless you were white, right? And thus the uh, book, White by Law by Ian Hammy Lopez, which I highly recommend people read if, if you haven't. Um, and so whiteness is embedded in the history of citizenship. And as a result, people who are from the Middle East and North Africa, who immigrated in relatively small numbers, we'll say hundreds of thousands between 1880 to 1924, before the immigration laws changed to make it very difficult to immigrate to this country if you were not from Northern or Western Europe. So the target, as many of us know, were primarily the Italian Catholics and the Eastern European Jews. But everyone was, uh, a plot, um, was affected by those 1924 laws. Plus we also had the Asian exclusion laws that have been around um, since the 1860s. So what happened was that those people from the Middle East and North Africa who were able to get here for however they may have arrived physically wanted to naturalize. And the only way they could do that was to go to court well, first in their application say, well, white. And the immigration officials increasingly challenged that and said, no, you're not. 
you're Turkish, you're a Muslim man, you're a Mohammedan, you're Asian, but you're not white because you're not European. And then they went to court and ultimately uh, were actually uh, over decades, would, it was court by, it was case by case, but ultimately in the 1970s, uh, the culmination of all those efforts was that Middle East and North Africa is now under white and Caucasian. So for those of you who are focused on diversity and inclusion and equity, if you have a large number of Middle East and North African students or employees, they are categorized as white. And so that uh, inflates the number of people who are of European origin. And as we all know, based on the last 20 years, uh, I am originally from Egypt, so I am of Middle East and North African origin. We do not have the social privileges of whiteness, even if we are legally categorized that way. And um, if you wanna read more about that, I have a piece called Legally White, Socially Brown, the Racialization of Middle Eastern Americans, which is up on my SSRN page. Okay, so I just wanted to give you that history to say that at least with regard to people from the Middle East and North Africa, this relationship with whiteness, which then allows you to become a citizen, which at least legally allows you to belong, although as you saw from my poem that um, I think we all know that citizenship and legal status are, are just one indicia and perhaps even the least important indicia of meaningful belonging. And so when you see something like the Muslim ban where Yes, it was directed, those who couldn't come were those who, well, originally it was anyone who wasn't a US citizen. And then eventually through advocacy litigation, it was narrowed to those who were not permanent residents from predominantly Muslim majority countries, essentially all of them that, uh, that Trump didn't wanna sell weapons to or couldn't sell weapons to. And that's where he made his exceptions, which was so that the military, US military industrial complex could still profit from selling uh, weapons, billions of dollars a year profit. But the Muslim ban, all, no one thought to say, well, what about these citizen and permanent resident Muslims who have been here most of their lives? They couldn't see their spouses. They couldn't see their, their um, fiancés, their parents, and sometimes even their children. So let's move to religion. Um, just a, a couple of just general observations is that the majority, the majority of Arabs, Middle East, North Africans in America are Christian, not Muslim. So just remember that it's a little over 60% of the Arabs, of Middle East, North Africans. So the, the Muslim population, which we don't have a full accurate count of because there's, as you know, on the census religion is not counted, which I, I personally agree with, but uh, the estimate is, Low end 5 million, high end 7 million. Although they've gotten quite a bit of attention, lots more negative attention by, uh, by the Trump administration and Bush and even uh, Obama under his current violent extremism program. But of those, let's say 6 million Muslims, 30, 25 to 30% are African American, uh, about 30% are Middle East North African and 35 to 40% are about are South Asian. Uh, or 30 percent South Asian, then you have a mix, right? And then you also have a, a large, a, an increasing number of Latino, uh, Latinx uh, Americans, Latin American, no, Latinx uh, Americans who are converting to Islam, and it could be up to five percent. Again, hard to tell. But the point is, what has happened, and when I talk in my poem about assimilation, is the more religious you are the less you belong or that you will be told that you belong. And the state will remind you and the public will remind you and the media will remind you. And so assimilation for Muslims to a large extent is similar to any immigrant group, right? And I'm gonna talk about the 70% immigrant because again, you have 25 to 30% that are African-Americans. And in, in, I have a book coming out called The Racial Muslim, When Racism Quashes Religious Freedom. Uh, which focuses primarily on the immigrant Muslim experiences, but recognizes that much of the discrimination and racism that African American Muslims have experienced, it overlaps. It's a, it, it crosses into both the immigrant Muslim, but most certainly the African American experience writ large, regardless of, of religion. 
But all that is to say that the more religious you are, and that does actually apply to African Americans too, in terms of if they're wearing the hijab, right? If there's anything visible about a Muslim, whether they're immigrant, uh, children of immigrants or African American, uh, that the way you look in terms that is associated with your religion, not just a foreign culture or foreign country, but your religion specifically, uh, that then signals that you don't want to belong and that we don't want you to belong the state as well as um, many Americans of different races. So there are people, as we all know, it's not just people of the majority white race, which is temporarily the majority you know, for the next 20, 30 years, and then that's going to change, are not the only ones that are anti-Muslim because of the stereotyping in society and, and the media. But what that has translated into is selective enforcement of counterterrorism laws, selective uh, enforcement of surveillance laws, and a criminalization of Muslim identity, or I should say orthodox Muslim identity. And so though people who identify as Muslim uh, still have a sense of conditional belonging, conditioned on their assimilation into white Protestant uh, normativity, which again is what all immigrants have to experience. But uh, in a, if you don't play that game, you actually you face criminalization in addition to vilification. And, um, and you also face hate crimes and all kinds of violence. And that then leads into political rights. So what we've seen, and I have a forthcoming paper out called Manufacturing Muslim Terrorism, which takes a very deep dive into 570 anti-terrorism prosecutions against Muslims since 2001, since 9-11, and makes it, it's very clear from the data, especially as you compare it to the rise of right-wing white extremism, some of which is animated and informed by Christian theology. They're perverted and, and skewed interpretation of Christian theology, but nonetheless, it does have some of the right wing extremists uh, do ground their, their white supremacy in Christianity. Is what you find is if a Muslim posts anything online that in any way uh, shows that they uh, support ISIS or Al Qaeda or oppose the war in Iraq or oppose you know, American imperialism in the Middle East, they find themselves uh, subject to sting operations and informants infiltrate and essentially lure them into a fake plot. So to be continued on that because that in itself is its own, is its own presentation. But I just wanted to say that there are very real liberty uh, interests. And then there's also the surveillance of mosques. Uh, many of us, I, for those of you who may have been um, reading the New York Times around 2011 to 2014, uh, but the, the story hit in 2011 about the massive surveillance that the NYPD had been conducting against mosques, Muslim student associations, universities, coffee shops, hookah bars all over the East Coast, because effectively anywhere there were Muslims that were congregating, as far as the FBI was concerned and the NYPD, they were working together, uh, there was going to be potential terrorism. Right? And the more religious you were, the more uh, dangerous you were. And if you were religious and dissident, then you're, you're absolutely persona non grata. There isn't even a, a, a question of your belonging. And then finally, I, I just want to highlight uh, something that people may not have paid attention to during the Muslim ban uh, issue because it was buried in all of the anti-Muslim rhetoric that Trump was spewing because it never stopped. Uh, was the Muslim registry, right? The special registration, which has been a long standing tradition of the United States against people from Muslim majority countries, in addition to other, other immigrant communities, but from the Iranians, um, the Iraqis, and then whenever there's a conflict, whenever there's a war, you're presumed to be suspicious irrespective of how long you've been here. You're presumed to be a fifth uh, column. And again, I address that in a lot more detail in my book, The Racial Muslim. But I just wanted to kind of give you all an overview of th these are the different uh, fault lines and, and points of contention where it's clear there's no question <laughs> that you don't belong, right? I mean, there are other conversations we, can, we have about the passing and covering and identity performances that Muslims, Arabs, and South Asians have to play, similar to other minorities. And I have a piece called Coercive Assimilationism, The Perils of Muslim Women's Identity Performance in the Workplace, which explores that in depth. But those are the, that's kind of a different category 
uh, of people who, who try to belong, who want to belong, who play by the rules, and yet still uh, you don't belong for reasons that, that we all know. So I will end there and i um, happy to, I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation and thank you again for inviting me to uh, present my thoughts. Thank you, Sahar. Wow, what a rich panel we just had on topics that have us at the center, um, very different groups. Um, but which have so many themes that cross um, in so many ways. So before I go to the Q&A, I actually wanted, because we're trying to promote this idea of conversation and we have brought these amazing scholars together, I was wondering if the three of you on the panel had any specific questions for each other before I open it up to the group as a whole. Okay, then I'm going to go to the questions that, oh, Karee, did you have a comment or a question? Well, I, I somewhat, uh, and it's, and it's unformed, uh, so apologies, uh, but thank you for the prompting. It took me a while to sort of think through. Um, and um, I'm just really fascinated. Um, uh, I'm thinking, so I'm teaching a, a, a class this semester on Black Europe, and and so in fact, for both of your uh, uh, presentations, there's something really rich. Uh, Sahar, uh, your, uh, your poem speaks to ideas about uh, belonging in terms of inclusion and exclusion. And for me, that is one of the things that I, I love to, to talk to my students about in terms of thinking about nationalism and especially forms of ethno-nationalism that are sort of produced through these ideas of inclusion and exclusion so that is 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 one aspect uh, so it's let, it's more of a, of a comment uh and sort of a thank you for for making that um really bringing that into the room and uh chandra um i just really fascinating with uh i'm gonna uh, in my mind i can only see uh uh flamboyant you know so so apologies but but I was just also really fascinated with that history of, of organizing and thinking about uh, whether or not uh, there are connections between those modes of organizing in the Netherlands. Uh, and let's say the kinds of modes, everything from uh, Zwarte Piet is racist to uh, um, uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, and, and how do, are there, are there continual useful intersections um, um, that are, are part of uh, uh, these contemporary struggles? So thank you both. It's just it's super, super cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off just to give more time for the pan, for the attendees because I know as someone who's been on the other side, because uh, you know once the three of us start talking, it's gonna be two thirty. <laughs> But you, but thank you both. I mean, I, I learned a tremendous amount. So it's, it's this is I love interdisciplinary conferences. Me too. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for for the points you both brought in. And I think this is what excites me most as somebody who was able to come come into these spaces of really thinking about how transnational work travels. Um, you know, and, and especially kind of hearing about these different articulations that really speak to, I think, the complex ways of thinking through um, diaspora, which again is theorized so differently um, from a European perspective, but through the movement, I have been able to kind of think in some of the ways that you have presented and people this morning about what it means to think about those, um, you know, comparative forms of belonging. But I've, I've definitely noted down your question, happy to address that after other questions. It's really great, thank you. Okay, well, I think this question um, definitely will work with respect to the presentations for both of you, Korea and Chandra. So you both um, 
talk about historical, uh, yours, Korea, historical figure, um, a writer writing about someone in the past. And Chandra, you're talking about a movement um, in the 80s. So um, talk about the importance of studying that history for today. It's a large question. <laughs> um, you know, it's when talking about history, it's hard to not, uh, you know, talk about broad cliches, uh, you know, or sort of, uh, I've heard um, the phrase bumper sticker platitudes, um, uh, which I subscribe to, you know, uh, there's just something very uh, important uh, about uh, thinking about these historical moments, uh, and not only because I think there is a uh, always a direct, I mean, of course, there's a way in which something that happens in the past has an impact upon the present. But sometimes I think that um, it's easy to believe that wherever we are today, this is the most modern or this is the most progressive or as opposed to imagining, you know, other moments that may have happened in the past. Uh, and so I always love to to spend a little, little bit uh, of time uh, historicizing arguments, ideas, uh, in order to find, you know, um, what to me, subjects or ideas that kind of slip, slip through the cracks. Um, and that for me is one of the things I really love about uh, archival research is, is sort of finding uh, you know, going through, you know, a variety of archives, you know, um, from the textual to the sonic to the embodied, uh, in order to find narratives uh, that we definitely need for today. Uh, and so, so I, I feel like there is a way that using uh, archives um, um, as one mode of thinking about uh, his, uh, historical research, uh, it can't help but help us uh, uh, think deeper about the predicaments that we are in today. Yeah, I think I feel very similar, um, especially because I think archives are so incredibly political, right? And especially as I outlined a little bit in the Dutch context, there's really only one book published in Dutch about the Black migrant and refugee movement. And I think the larger conversation is also about where, is, where does knowledge production come from, right? And where, where is it located? And in the Dutch context, it's incredibly hard to publish about race. We li there's literally like, you know, so few Black professors, Gloria Becker, um, whose name I definitely want to uphold because her work has been incredible and informative. Um, but I think, you know, engaging with these archives that are marginalized as it is, um, is really important for current movement work, as well as to talk about the larger politics of knowledge production. Um, but it's also for me a way to think about how do we chart these histories? Because often what happens in the European context is that we use US frameworks in to understand race and the politics belonging. And I think what the what especially the, the Dutch Black migrant and refugee movement shows is that these kinship networks were long in place before they started networks of exchange with people in the US, in um, the UK, in different parts of the world. That is not to say that knowledge didn't travel and inspire them, but often the story um, becomes told from a US perspective. And I think it's really important to kind of set the archival record straight, if you will, to say, for instance, um, black lesbian collectives such as Sister Outsider were organizing um, long before they made a connection with Audre Lorde, for instance. But the story is often told from the perspective of Audre Lorde travels to Europe and starts important kind of kinship networks. And that's true and that's important. But I think these archives kind of require something of us as researchers in terms of not just visiting the archives, but also to kind of ask of us what those materials do to us in the way that we tell those stories. So again, I think this also comes back to your research cards, why it's so important to truly kind of delve into those cultures of transnational exchange 
because in that very idea of exchange is that kind of traveling and the hierarchies of knowledge production. So I just, may I just make one comment, which is just as a, a legal scholar, because we are not empiricists by training, um, <laughs> to, except for, I suppose, when we do doctrinal research on case law, but, but in terms of from a, we're not trained in social science methodology and, and the like. But I will say that it's, it's extremely helpful to be reading the history when you're trying to show, you know, whether it's harm, uh, systemic harm, systems that are in place and trying to make the visible, the invisible visible, especially when you're dealing with the systemic racism or disparate impact or implicit biases and, and prejudice. So I have found, um, now I, I don't go into the archives, <laughs> but, but reading the work of historians is, um, is something that I, I wish you know, more lawyers did, at least law, law professors did, at least scholars did, because it certainly reminds you of um, sometimes how things haven't changed as much as we think they have. They've just taken on a different form or they're called something different and they look different or they're by different people doing the same things. And so you think, think it's something different. And um, that's something that I always you know, teach my students because one of the American mythologies we have so many American exceptionalism mythologies. And one is that we evolve and we change and whatever happened in the past was the past and you know, we're better than we were. And I think you know, anybody who studies say massive incarceration <laughs> understands that um, Michelle Alexander was, was quite uh, poignant when she said it's just the new Jim Crow. And so I think that applies in, in so many other areas of, of legal civil rights, you know, civil rights in the law. So thank you to the historians who do your work. And the archives give you access to the primary text because even the historian, there, there's a narrative that's been put when people study primary texts and until you get actually back, back to them, you've always got that filter that's there. Um, Sunny, I believe you have a, a couple of questions. I do, and you cannot see me, but I'm, I'm nodding my head in agreement with what you all are saying about a particular spend and narrative being put on the information that's taken from the archive. But my questions are not necessarily about the archive. Um, I do have two questions, one for Sahar and one for Cree. Uh, so for Sahar, I, I, I think it's been a theme and we've been discussing the fact that race is not a productive category within Europe. Some of us are working very hard to feed it back into the narrative so that it's discussed again. Um, and in place of race, we get other types of difference such as religion, um, particularly Islam within the European context. And many uh, scholars have argued that Islam and has taken, being Muslim has taken the place of race in many ways. And I'm wondering if you feel the same thing is happening here. It seems to me as you start to talking more about your work, that that might be a position that you were taking. So there's that question. And then for Korea, I had a, a question about your use of the term freedom dreams for heterosexual men. And I'm wondering if that is connected to rights of citizenship or something else. So I will stop there. Thanks to both of you. You are on point. Yeah, that is essentially the thesis of my book. <laughs> the racial is, and I, I am not an expert on Europe, and every time I, I, I think of going and studying, say, the, the Muslims in France in particular, uh, because it's just so overt, right, the anti-Muslim racism is, I, I, I don't want to, I, I say this knowing that it, it's not accurate, but, and I know it's reductivist, but there are points when one wonders, are the Muslims of France equivalent in some way to the African Americans of America, right? the Blacks of America. Again, I, I know that that is very reductionist, but it's clear that Muslims in France have a very special status in terms of subordination, right? Um, and maybe it's unpacked through Algerian and, and Moroccan, and it, it's, it's more nuanced than that. But one reason I don't study it is because of the language issues, and I don't believe that one can do justice to, to the research if you don't you know, research within the language. Um, so I've, I've resisted that, though it's very, it's very tempting intellectually. So I intentionally focus on the US. And so, but having said that, uh, you know, the, one of the big differences when you're dealing with religious minorities and, and bias, bigotry, or racism against religious minorities between Europe and the US is the, the concept of religious freedom. It's very different. Uh, in addition to hate speech, 
right? So there's just some, legally speaking, it's quite different. So America is in a position in contrast to France that says, no, we are laissez we don't, we, we don't want anyone to show their, they have their own unique history, right? These are the religion uh, that may or may not be connected to, to, the, to the Northern Africans. But, but here we pride ourselves in saying, this is the place where you come, where people came from Europe, from Northwest Europe, for to, to, to escape religious persecution and it's part of the identity. So the, that hypocrisy is glaring in the United States. And yes, that is essentially what I'm arguing is that in the book is that um, religion has been reframed in the discourse and in the, and then the psyche, like the American psyche through media, through government action, through government rhetoric, um, such that people now perceive and treat Muslims as a race. And once you take them out of the religion category, then you can be an evangelical Christian who believes your religious freedom rights are violated by legalization of same-sex marriage, by um, uh, the, the legalization of abortion, by you know, pick, uh, contraception being available in, in ha or having to be available by all employers. You know, pick your religious freedom dispute that's brought by evangelical Christians who are vet, who religious freedom is their number one culture war issue. And yet when it comes to the Muslims, like, oh no, no, you, you don't have religious, you're not, you're not, you don't have religious freedom. And that's why you're you're not a you're not a, a religion, you're a race. Now some people have said, well, it's, they're treated as a political ideology, but that's it's, it's just a coded language for race. And so your religion does the work that your pheno, that phenotype traditionally does in racializing in the US context anyway. Um, so, and I, I hope you don't mind if I put the link of the book in there. I have to like put my marketing hat on now. Um, it's under pre-order, but I go into a lot of depth in that in the US context. And I would love to read more about, I mean, I, I welcome recommendations of literature, especially in the, in the French context. Um, because I'd like to do some, some comparators. But for better or worse, my view, this is my, my physician, is that yes, of course, race is socially constructed, but I, it's a master category. I mean, I, I don't think we can not talk about race in the United States. Um, and I don't think that, um, I mean, I think we have to, because the alternative has been thus far, the colorblind narrative, and that does even more harm. Than, than to acknowledge that race exists, acknowledge is socially constructed, and then really try to unpack it, dissect it, and, and think about it. But I, I'm not very optimistic that race can ever escape the lexicon of American politics. Beautiful. Sunny, I believe you also directed a question at Curry. Sure, yeah. I mean, this is a, a, it's a great question. So I would say, you know, uh, I feel, when I use the, the phrase uh, uh, freedom dreams, I always feel slightly uh, sheepish uh, because in some ways I'm thinking uh, about uh, Robin Kelly's use of the term or at least his book. Though, and his, his book isn't characteristic of my critique. My critique is really the way in which within the field of military history, military studies, especially those studies that are attempting to reevaluate the performance of African-American soldiers, that, that there is in some sense, um, the relationship between, let's say these freedom dreams uh, that, that are framed in this heteronormative framework, I would say they're linked to a promise of citizenship. Uh, the promise arguably, you know, uh, is rarely fulfilled. Um, and, um, and so I'm critical of, of how, numbers of texts that have come that have come out you know past 30 years or so that that really do want to critique uh, a narrative that was pretty widespread that that african american soldiers were were bad soldiers um and uh, and i'm not that kind of military historian um, um i'm not interested in that so much but i also i'm not interested in that, in that because i feel like it's important to fracture what to me seems to be a, a hero citizen feedback loop. Um, and that the belief that, you know, that doing something heroic uh, is, will in fact uh, create uh, new opportunities for not only individual African-Americans, but African-Americans, uh, you know, African-American community writ large. Uh, 
Um, that's not saying that I don't think that people should be acknowledged for the work that they do, but it's also why I'm more interested in talking about uh, military uh, workers um, um, than soldiers in the sense of trying to think about the actual labor that different subaltern classes uh, are tasked with in the military historically. Uh, and that to me, there's something different about that. And so just in terms of thinking about um, the notion of, of, of a performance, let's say, of, of forms of manhood, you know, one of that could be martial heroism, but, uh, but it, it's, it's also very clear that sexual conquest is one way of performing a certain kind of uh, something that would be seen as, as not necessarily heroic, but as a way of, of claiming a kind of manhood right uh, um, um, in uh, the, uh, the public or the private spheres. And I think that that's problematic. I mean, I think that, so especially when we're talking about uh, histories uh, uh, around, um, let's say uh, Germany or just say Europe, World War II, um, there is a way in which the assumption is, is that, that every subject that we're talking about um, is cis and straight. And, and I can only say that I know that that is not the case um, um, because I've started to do the work to look in those archives. And I'm seeing how different laws, uh, especially, I mean, one of the things I didn't talk about uh, is that the Pittsburgh Courier uh, was really uh, um, uh, one, of the, one of the first newspapers during uh, the occupied period in Berlin to really critique what were known as blue discharges. Uh, and blue discharges were just, were discharges that were given out that, uh, that stopped uh, um, um, soldiers uh, from uh, having to go through a court martial. Uh, and that meant that people could just be discharged immediately. And what was happening is that there were two groups that were being discharged uh, immediately. Um, one were sort of black soldiers and the other group uh, were, were LGB or let's say gay and lesbian soldiers. Uh, and the Pittsburgh Courier actually, again, as, as this black newspaper in the 1940s, uh, they were critical of both uh, black soldiers and um, gay and lesbian soldiers uh, being denied their, their rights um, of, of due process. Um, and um, though they don't necessarily make the additional step to imagine that perhaps there are also some black gay and black lesbian soldiers that are also being disenfranchised uh, by this, there was an awareness that this is something that we have to take serious, uh, um, especially from folks who have just uh, um, um, uh, been drafted to serve uh, um, 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 these United States. So that's where I, I have, uh, that's where I try to um, push back at sort of received narratives. Uh, not to say that, you know, it's not important to talk about the freedom dreams of heterosexual men, but to also recognize that they often take uh, a, up a lot of space in the room. Thank you for that, Kari. So Sahar has, um, has to leave and she might've had to, get off um, at this point. Um, so we just have our two panelists left, but that's fine. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out about uh, Sahar's poem, we've been talking all day today about kind of what does belonging mean and you know what can it mean that's not assimilation and that kind of thing. But it struck me in the first lines of her poem, she said, belonging means to be safe. And that, that is something that I think anyone in any kind of terms of belonging to be safe. And in so many of the instances that we've talked about the ramifications of not belonging or being excluded or not um, doing what's necessary to um, be part of the we in her poem. I just was struck by, um, that aspect of yes, belonging would have to mean to be safe. And in all of so many of the contexts that we talked about, that is not the case. 
Um, I want to ask one more question of the panel, but then I have the delightful task of just segueing us immediately into the final conversation. So I don't have to end this panel or end my conversations um, with the two of you because they can continue. But I did have a shout out in the chat that um, there's some interest in you saying at least a couple words, Chandra, about how your work on waterways intersects with the uh, topic of today. And with your explanation, then what will officially end this part of it, but just move directly into the final conversation, which will involve um, any and all of the panelists. And um, I'll directly get the audience involved. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, so very briefly, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Amsterdam, um, but Amsterdam is made out of um, canals, bridges, locks. And so even if you haven't visited a quick like Google search will show you the inner city canals. And so those inner city canals um, are, were constructed in the 17th century, the obvious links to the Dutch involvement, in history of slavery, um, Dutch East India Company. And so, in our current kind of geography of Amsterdam, canals are, um, are are such an articulation of white national Dutch belonging. It's a tourist attraction. It's where pride takes place. Um, you know, it's charming. It's quaint. So there are all these competing, complicated like ways of reading the canals. Um, part of what I'm doing with the larger project is using the infrastructure of the canals to think through. Um, kinship and exchange. So I'm using the canals as kind of a metaphor to inspire some of my methodology. Um, but I'm also interested in these complex histories around water. Um, so very briefly, the Dutch uh, are very, the Netherlands is a very small country, colonized um, large parts of the world and are very much known for using water as a form of domination and control and management. So the Dutch are called in, um, for instance, when Katrina happened here in the US, the Dutch were one of the first to call. Um, this happens when the Suez Canal ship was stuck, the Dutch were one of the first to be uh, on standby. So I'm interested in those complexities. Also the, the Netherlands is under sea level, like the country's literally like sinking. Um, and then also a lot of these um, references in terms of the Netherlands being flooded by migrants, like the language is very evocative. So I'm interested in using water in those two ways. I didn't speak about that today, but Flamboyant is actually um, situated on one of the main inner canals of Amsterdam. And so um, in terms of biking to the archives, I was traveling through the city center of Amsterdam, going through like passing Flamboyant and thinking about what does it mean um, for this feminist and queer center to be in the city center of Amsterdam during the 80s. And now that history is completely erased. The city center is very white, like there are no black or brown people who live there, who can afford to live there. So what does it mean that that kind of bloom continues to linger on in the imagination? So that's very short in terms of how I um, am thinking through waterways. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. I have a couple of questions that were in the Q&A, but I'm going to move them. Are you two both able to stay for the conversation at the end? Korean channel, wonderful. Then I'm just going to segue um, into what is going to be our final conversation. It's changed a little bit because we, um, Sunny Rucker Chang, who you've met um, and, and know is, is here and going to be a major part of this conversation. But um, one of our colleagues at the law school, um, Yolanda Vasquez was also going to be in this conversation. She is, her areas of expertise are immigration, crimmigration, um, but she had a family emergency today. And so um, she will not be here, but we are, able to do kind of what we wanted this to be at the end, which is to draw everyone into the conversation. So those of you who are panelists, if you feel comfortable putting your video on, we can all be here. Um, if that doesn't work for you, that's fine. And then I'm going to manage the um, conversation a little differently here. So instead of putting your comments, you, you can put your comments in the Q&A if you would like me to ask them. But if you would like to ask your own question, then um, you can raise your hand, I believe. 
and we can unmute you and then you are able to speak directly to the panelists to kind of do, every, do everything that's possible to break through this screen environment in which, um, in which we are. So um, I was gonna turn this over to you, Sunny, but I do want to let you know that Tiffany has an excellent question that is to both, um, okay. So I'll turn it over to you and let you take over that part of it. So. Okay, so why don't we and just we can just start with that question and then I'll give my remarks and then we'll we'll all come back together. So let me pull that one up. Um, I, okay, there we are. So um, for both Chandra and Kari, do you see your historical actors, BMR women, William Gardner Smith and Madeline G. Goodwin as embracing or practicing what Nadia Ellis, a queer form of belonging? Um, are these examples of a diaspora, not only as a mode of feeling or belonging, but also one of loss? And that's for both of you. That's, I mean, a fantastic question. And, um, and I would say that the notion of loss, I think is, uh, you know, and it's funny to think about queer belonging uh, um, um, in, the, the, the terms of loss uh, because I think it's it's very it's very real and I do think that there is that there's something there um, you know um, and it's something that I guess I'm 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 trying to to reckon with a little bit in terms of of I would say that it's actually it's leading me to do more of a kind of critical fabulation so to think about uh, Sophia Hartman's work. Um, and I sometimes tell my students, I was like, well, you know, the last thing you should, you know, the first thing you should do is go to the archive. The last thing you should do is critically fab fabulate. <laughs> just in a sense of like, just to make sure that there's something there that, you know, you, 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 you know, that you didn't miss. Um, but, um, but there is something there. And, um, and it's also the longing that I have, you know, in a sense of me trying to to uh, think through the relationship between William Gardner Smith and Madeline Goodwin. And, and, you know, so in some ways, you know, it's me rereading um, their, their, their conversations, you know, and really trying to um, restore agency, you know, while at the same time critiquing certain things in certain moments. And, and, and also my own desires, my own longing to, uh, I, I can say honestly that, you know, the biggest part of, of longing in this sense is me wanting to uh, find a paper trail of Goodwin's uh, life uh, uh, since she came, when she came to the US. That has been incredibly dif difficult. Um, and um, though I think I know exactly where I have lots of information. Um, it still hasn't um, manifested itself uh, clearly. And I think that in some ways I, I have to make peace with a certain kind of longing. Um, and, and that's it. And, and yeah, I, I, I guess it's something that I'm, I'm, I'm still wrestling with. I'm still wrestling with the idea of what, because in fact, I wanted uh, uh, um, Goodwin's story to be the last part of my book and it didn't work. Uh, and, and so, uh, and it's just like, man, you know, and I really wanted it and, and it had a lot to do with uh, someone who I thought was a relative and I called them and they, there was just a different, the vibe was not great. Uh, and it made me begin to think that um, that, uh, well, I'll say this, my mom said, when I tried to explain to her, you know, she's like, well, sometimes, you know, people don't want to be found. And I had to rest, I had to sort of reckon with that, the idea that even though I thought I had done everything that I had presented myself, um, you know, as, as a responsible researcher, um, you know, like, it made me realize that, you know, that though I had, I had spent so much time in my, my first book writing about people and subjects who had already, who had died a long time ago, 
the idea of talking about folks uh, whose presence is still among us, even if they've recently passed. Uh, that takes a, another uh, skill set and uh, another way of, of, of reckoning with, 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 with our own desires as researchers uh, and thinkers and critics. Uh, and so those are, and so for me, that does feel queer, you know, in a very real way. I'm absolutely inspired by this question and also Kari's response. Um, I, I definitely feel like the archival research for me is very much around abundance and loss um, because I definitely think for my generation of having grown up in the Netherlands, but definitely the generations coming after me and Kari, this also relates a little bit to your point about um, activism happening now in the Netherlands and uh, the movements around Black Pete and the BLM solidarity movements. I think there was a real kind of, you know, there's this real schism in, in the Dutch context of like, oh, this country is so open, so tolerant, so progressive, right? Um, but we don't talk about race. And I think it relates to a lot of the questions around colorblindness, race happens in the US, race happens in South Africa. Like even the BLM protests are very much in solidarity. There's not a real critical analysis, um, of course, people on the ground are doing that right but there's not a real like national public academic analysis um, of race in the Dutch context in in politics in everyday experiences and we all know that that research exists um, but that also people such as Philomena Asset um, for instance are like in the US you know Gloria Becker did her PhD in the US I've done my PhD in the UK so there's also there's something real about where are you able to do that work about race in the Netherlands and I think um, the conversation around loss and queerness in terms of engaging with the BMR movement was definitely like oh this work has been done right like these women were theorizing and in conversation and we're predominantly women but not only I should say but the, the movement of men of color was much more limited in the Netherlands than the movement um, of women. But um, I think there was a sense of recognition and, and loss and abundance in working with these archival materials um, and also stories. I've also interviewed um, a lot of women who were active within the movement um, for my project. Um, but I think part of the queerness is also this kind of recognition of um, two things. I think one, what it means to, to organize in, in a hostile climate that appears to be open and liberal. Um, I think what, what a lot of the commonalities of what the BMR women talked about was the premature death of Black and Brown women and how those stories are figured into the archive. So there's um, really touching and, and beautiful and moving and complicated correspondence between um, Tanya Leon and Audrey Lord, who both were diagnosed with breast cancer, and they talk about what that means for, for their lives, for movement work, um, you know, but there are also stories of women who just continue to be unnamed, like um, stories of Filipina women who came to the Netherlands, um, a lot of migrant women who worked as sex workers who, who either died or disappeared or went missing, and, um, you know, coming across those stories, I think, there's something inherently queer about thinking about migration differently, right? Because these women are already not imagined as migrants in the Dutch context. They're also not imagined as knowledge producers. Um, so I think there's, you know, without kind of making queerness like banal or applying that framework of like, you know, queering um, migration, I think it's, it is really important to kind of recognize how there's a, a, a nostalgia and loss and queerness in within the archive, but how at the same time, the archive also shifts our understanding of what is read as queer. And I think um, many of the examples in the archive speak to non-Western modes of sexuality, different ways that women like got with each other in different like uh, in Surinamese or Indonesian or Turkish or like Moroccan like circles, there were all different ways of articulating queerness, right, that were like way beyond the idea of like coming out the closet or having separate like spaces or so. And I also think that has something to do with um, the way that we, we tend to come to queer studies and, and how in itself, I think it's also a, a larger conversation of some of the losses within um, queer studies and how it's been applied to migration and how definitely in the Netherlands, 
um, there is very much a focus on um, queer history from a white Western perspective. And um, these other histories are just kind of like marginalized, right? And I know that, that is also some a conversation happening in the US, but I think that's also touches on this question. So yeah, I think that's where I'll, I'll end it. But yeah, thank you for the question. And Kari also thank you for your um, response and work. It's really inspiring. Okay, so I do have some brief remarks that I'd like to make, very short, um, and then we'll just move in and open it up. And if, as questions or thoughts come along, please do put them in the chat box or raise your hand as the case may be, we'll, and then we will just unmute you so we can actually have a broad uh, conversation. Um, so I've just been noting as we've been talking throughout the day, just some things, and I just would like to reflect upon them for a minute. Uh, so in the colloquy today, we've learned of various methodological and disciplinary approaches and ways of understanding belonging and difference from historical precedents to contemporary manifestations in scholarly and pedagogical practice to institutional methods and ways of understanding, uh, which must necessarily address questions about power which is interesting, we haven't talked so much about power at this conference um, and how to use it when and if you have it. And these abound in our discussions of belonging and difference and the consequences of a multitude of ways of seeing and understanding ourselves within and outside of groups. I wanted to move ever so briefly to my own work on comparative and relational analyses of Romani and African-American communities. And I should be more specific, European Romani communities, which I should say is, is interdisciplinary by nature. Uh, the question and issues raised in these studies are both situated historically and continue into our present in part because of the colonial matrix of power or coloniality that has separated bodies according to their worth or assigned value to them. Both European Roma and African Americans are marked in their societies and racialized as different and affected by power imbalances. In light of World Romani Day or International Romani Day, which thank you, Manuela, uh, for referencing earlier, I think it's important to think trans. Atlantically about the ways that coloniality and the worth of bodies and groups continue to inform interactions and experiences. Uh, specifically today on World Romani Day, I would like to acknowledge the shared challenges and victories that minority minoritized groups experience and work to overcome and find new ways of belonging to forge path that their own paths forward from a point of pride, even if it arises from what is portrayed by majorities as different, other, and sometimes even shameful. It has not been said yet, but April, April 8th this year also marks a time of a formal Holocaust remembrance, and therefore a day that many members of Romani, of Romani communities have fought long, hard fights to have their Holocaust stories told alongside others who suffered from fascist regimes during World War II. In their stories, we see how manifestations of belonging and difference cast many minoritized communities as outsiders. And through the parallels I have listed uh, today, I have uh, the panels, excuse me, I've listened to today, I have learned that this as a feature pervades many aspects of our lives from our fields, our working spaces, and even our own personal positionalities or subject positions. Through the day and from the panelists' pre presentations, I have thought about the universality of racialization or what philosopher Charles Mills has called the racial contract with the goal of acknowledging binaries of black and white while capturing or at least attempting to capture the breadth of experiences and absences that speaking in such binaries as, universal, as universals creates or as one of our participants questions insinuated that being and claiming an identity is an act of enduring coloniality. So I will always I will be thinking a bit more about naming as a practice and what powers it grants or takes away from those who are being named and the implications that it has on belonging and difference. So then at this point, uh, I would like to open the floor to the panelists to reflect on the day and ask panelists, and you don't have to answer this question, really, we can make it a lot more broad if you'd like, uh, if, you, if you've heard any new points of views or scholarly concepts that you see as potentially influencing your work moving forward. Um, and then we can open it up to those in attendance. Thank you so much. I can go ahead, um, although it is really terrible to have to follow you, Sunny, <laughs> because that was just amazing, um, your sort of overview of the day or your summary of what the day and sort of what you got out of it. Uh, what I have to say will be kind of ridiculous in comparison, but 
Um, you know, I, I'm noting here actually that, you know, our, all, I, I, it's really unfortunate that all of our legal uh, panelists could not stay throughout the day to join us. Um, and, you know, I'm so ins I've been so inspired by um, the presentations and the talks. Um, and, and something that's really emerged for me as a theme in terms of something I would like to think more about uh, in, in my work is this notion of coloniality. Um, we, you know, in the law, we really do not tend to think about, you know, we talk about things like exclusion and inclusion, but not belonging and difference. Um, we talk about, when we talk about difference, we talk about it in the context of colorblindness, which is sort of what dominates, um, you know, our constitutional jurisprudence on equality. And it's, it's, it's really hard to sort of make these interventions in a way that, I'm just gonna say this and people may disagree, that sort of mainstream legal scholars take seriously. Um, and, you know, so I'm always trying, like sort of looking for ways to reframe these old things that I keep saying <laughs> in my scholarship. And, and I, I feel like a coloniality offers a really excellent kind of lens through which to look, through which to analyze things and to think about things. Um, and then also, I just, you know, I wanted to make some notes about, um, or I made some notes about uh, like coloniality its relationship to belonging. I think that in law we can look at, um, we can look, you know, we can think about it in terms of expulsion, deportation, exclusion, um, but uh, we usually look at it in terms of, you know, we're looking at it in terms of sort of hate crimes, you know, um, anti name your minority violence, you know, um, but I really think coloniality can help us think about these things more creatively, and we really need that in legal scholarship. We really need a more creative way to think about things. Um, and I just really appreciate um, all of your presentations and, and the, the questions have been, the questions from the audience and other, others have been great, so thank you. Thanks, Emily. I wanna say for myself, one of the things that struck me from the very beginning is when um, Natsu in the initial conversation, um, she said, difference is necessary for balance. And that so struck me because definitely in the legal world, when we talk about difference, that is theorized almost immediately in forms of subordination. How does difference within our society subordinate? And not a productive way of talking about the positivity of, of difference, because I came to this conference, you know, wanting to hear a lot about what can belonging mean that is not assimilation? And there's so many good ideas that have gone here, but that original way to think about it of where you can think of difference in a really positive way. I just love that statement that difference is necessary for balance, which is disrupting um, the hierarchies, the way um, these conversations so often, um, when we crunch them into the language in which we talk about these issues and um, our in work with them. That's why I've, I've just loved this conference in that Language is power. How we talk about things is power. And there's so much erasure that comes because of the way we do talk about things. And so this kind of opening up um, and figuring out ways to talk about things across disciplines in different kinds of ways has really just kind of exploded my mind in a lot of hopefully very productive ways. I've also seen, and we are gonna figure out a way to get and share with everyone some of the um, wonderful resources that people have been sharing in the, in the chat. So look for um, some of that from us after. And if you have other sources that you think we should um, be sending out, please put them in there and we will make sure to do that. 
Um, and Dean Williams had her hand raised as well. Is it possible that I, yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, this is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what I thought had happened. I, I mean, I cannot change the name this time and I cannot uh, turn on the camera, but this is Manuela. <laughs> so. Sorry, Manuela, please. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> okay, oh, thank you. Um, Extraordinary. Oh, okay. Now I. Okay. <clears throat> so, just um, two comments to bridge um, Sunny's comment that we haven't talked about power in, in then Emily's enthusiasm for the category of coloniality. Because um, it's interesting, of course, the, the category of coloniality of power does have the word power in it, but not in the sense of. Um, resting power away so much as in exercising power. So I guess um, we can talk about more, we can talk more about the agency. I don't really like the term agency, but um, kind of the political will in action needed in order to redistribute, reparate or repair um, and kind of redistribute would um, make the power part of coloniality also um, maybe not reversible, but something else than um, a kind of structure um, that's too much for us to be up against. And in, in that sense, I, I totally get that talking more about power is not the same as talking about coloniality of power. Um, and I, I don't know enough about um, legal scholarship by far, um, but um, I am aware of this Twail um, branch of criminal law. Do people know it? Is, am I talking about very banal things? So it's, it stands for um, third world approaches to international law. And um, some of the, peop the people in it, not all of them, um, do use the category of coloniality, especially in order to understand the role of the state alongside the, the role of um, kind of trading companies during colonialism and the role of the church. So I have a colleague, very dear colleague, Colombian lawyer, Jose Manuel Barreto, who talks about how the state is not a Leviathan, but a Cerberus because it has three heads. It's the company, the um, kind of government, and then the, the church. So that is one way of bringing coloniality into thinking the, the, the one part that I know. And I, I know there's a book um, that this kind of um, research group um, has brought out. Um, Marti Koskeniemi is one of the editors and um, it's Third World Approaches to International Law, Oxford University Press. Um, I can look it up and, and put it in the chat for you. Thank you. Emily, did you have a question earlier on in the chat that you said you would save for the conversation? Um, I, I did, but I see that Bill Morelli has his hand up. So I'm thinking that maybe Bill can ask his question. Thank I you. apologize for not being able to manage all my screens all that <laughs> well. <laughs> Please go ahead, Bill. Well, this is this is uh, silly coming from a non-academic. I mean, obviously, I, I've watched this with great interest, and not being somebody who is as familiar with all of these concepts as all of you are. Um, what struck me is that um, when you talk about belonging and difference, difference seems to me to inherently uh, determine multiple ways of belonging. I mean, that's the very essence of difference. It seems to me. And while I understand the negative implication of um, coerced or pressured assimilation, it seems that with 
with the difference uh, that people bring into any, any situation socially or politically that it would be a valid um, reaction to their own experience to, to assimilate voluntarily along a, a broad spectrum of whatever that means for the individual based on their difference. And I, I was just curious what people thought about that um, because there are some people who might say it is valid for me to assimilate to the ma maximum extent possible that I want to. And then some other people may say, I want to embrace more of my difference and less of my assimilation into uh, normative society. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I'll say briefly, I think that sometimes that there are interesting ways of, I, I was gonna say that, um, uh, I was gonna, basically there's a way of, of um, embracing uh, this notion of, uh, I'm sorry, you mentioned difference and then, and I think that the other term that you mentioned has lost, has gone through my head because I think that I, have, I sometimes have a hard time thinking about the kind of notion of um, uh, what's the opposite of difference, I guess, embracing or, or, or the normativity aspect. I mean, I think well, that- there, I'm sorry. I was thinking, I was thinking that if, if, if you have difference, it implies that there would be a wide range of individual responses to what belonging means. Um, and, and even though assimilation seems to have a, a negative connotation, right. that it seems that people with their own differences would, would um, feel that they could belong across an entire spectrum from non-assimilation to their own voluntary assimilation in a, in, a, in a more robust way than other people would feel would be appropriate. Right, thank you. I think that there can sometimes be interesting moments of of um, of using forms of assimilation in order to subvert subvert the normative, you know. Uh, and so that is sort of a different way of of thinking about the notion of because assimilation uh, uh, is I, I do have a hard time with assimilation, the idea of of choosing that. While at the same time, I also understand that the world isn't just uh, uh, about resistance. Sometimes it's about complicity as well. And really trying to find sort of uh, the tension between resistance and complicity makes a lot of sense for me. Um, that, but there is even something about, um, you know, the normative, which uh, I think people are always performing assimilation in the sense that um, that there is sometimes a fear that um, that you're not doing normal right. Um, you know, I think that uh, even the, you know, just sort of thinking about the, the most normative categories uh, of in American society, I mean, you know, we are now in a situation that's been happening for like, you know, probably 20, 30 years or so where there was a time where apparently like cis men, you know, didn't have eating disorders. Now we do, you know, um, and what does that mean in terms of the idea of attempting to assimilate to a, um, a sense of body image, uh, which uh, no one really can, can attain, you know? And so I know that's not exactly, that's, that's a different mode of thinking about assimilation but you know, I do want to trouble the notion of. Uh, I mean, I think people make all kinds of decisions, and 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 people can be strategic. Um, but I think that assimilation is probably as performative as any other mode of difference. Like you know, the way we talk about gender is performative. You know, I think that assimilation is it's an ongoing process, uh, and I think that it's difficult to get right, even for the folks who one would imagine uh, have the easiest uh, path forward. Thank you. Emily, I see your hand. Uh, 
You're muted. I keep doing that. Um, I've been doing that in class lately too. I don't know why. So um, Bill, I really appreciate your question. Um, it requires some thought and and. Korea, I appreciate also your response, um, but I wanted to also respond to the to, to Bill's question. You know, I think that there assimilation means you know there's sort of like a there's sort of like a micro idea of assimilation and a macro idea of assimilation. You know, and I and and assimilation it can be there's so many different kinds ways to assimilate so many contexts in which we assimilate for different reasons you know so um tiffany and natsu were talking earlier about um you know the doing interdisciplinary work and uh, i i think i think it was the two of you talking about how you know to get tenure right junior high faculty have to assimilate to the 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 disciplinary expectations um and expertise uh, to get tenure and to assimilate to sort of their departmental environment and politics and things like that in order then to be able to have a level of control um, and power over like their own careers, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and so there's that assimilation on, you know, on that level as one example, but there's also like assimilation in the sense of, um, racial formation, which is the way that, you know, so uh, um, Michael Omi and Howard Wynette have a very famous book called Racial Formation in the United States. And in it, they they describe a paradigm of racial formation that's based on ethnicity and that's based on the assimilation, the, the period of assimilation of Eastern European uh, and Jewish immigrants, right? And how they assimilated um, to become Americans. But I think assimilation can also be used as a tool of, of sustaining and creating racial hierarchy, um, gender hierarchy, class, you know, all of these kinds of things. And so it, I guess to me, it depends on what kind of assimilation we're talking about <laughs> and um, to what end it is being used. And so I'll just, I'll just close out this comment with a, like an, a personal anecdote. Like my parents immigrated uh, to the United States in Taiwan in 1967, from Taiwan in 1967, um, able to do so because of the passage of the Immigration and Nationality Act in 1965 that lifted quotas, right? Immigration qu quotas. And, um, um, you know, and I think for them, and I think for a lot of immigrants uh, and, and you know, they saw a certain kind of assimilation as a mode, of, a method of survival um, and achieving an amount of stability. Uh, and so that assimilation was about sort of keep your head down, work really hard, do all these things you're supposed to do. Um, and they eventually lead to like the stereotype of the model minority, you know? Um, I mean, and, and that's sort of impacted also by sort of immigration policies, but I, but I won't get into that. But the assimilation didn't go so far as you can dress the way you want, you can, you can do your hair the way you want, you can date who you want, uh, you can eat what you want, you know what I mean? It, it, so there's sort of like these cultural forms of assimilation and then these sort of like other kinds of forms of assim assimilation that that enable people who are different, who are markedly different to survive um, and to kind of um, create a life for themselves. Um, and so anyway, it's just a really long way, way of saying like there's, there's different kinds of assimilation. And so I think it really depends, but it's a great question. Just to add a small comment to what you just said, Emily, I was really struck this morning in the initial conversation, um, I believe it was Natsu again, who was describing assimilation as join our mind. And to me, that's a more, um, that's different than doing what you need to do to get to a position to maybe be able to say what you wanna say or that where it's actually, I think she also went on to say, to belong, you have to give up who you are. And on the spectrum of ways to assimilate, um, that seems to be 
particularly harmful if, if what that means is to join a mindset uh, that is not yours. This point also makes me think of some of the um, implementations by the Dutch state in terms of how um, foreigners, migrants have been named. So um, in, I believe it was in 1971, the Dutch decided that they needed to implement a system to track in policy and politics who was like a foreigner and who was native. So they introduced these terms like allochtone and autochton. Um, and to kind of distinguish who had non-Western ancestry, right? So if you had one parent who was born outside of the Netherlands, you would like be a non-Western allochton. And these terms are um, derived from Greek. But what was interesting is that it became so widely used within like just day-to-day -day life in schools that the terminology just became equivalent for anybody who wasn't white. Right. So then when they formally ended the use of the terminology in 2016, like that formal ending didn't mean anything that they didn't use it in policy anymore, because an average white Dutch person or even at if you're racialized as other, you would be used to kind of like be identified as an allochtone, as being foreign. And so even if you're like fourth generation, like that wouldn't matter. Right. So there's also this this larger question around, I think comes back to the question of language and power is, you know, th these kind of ways of assimilation um, are so deeply racialized in different ways. And in the Dutch context, you can very clearly see how that ties into anti-Blackness where it comes to the histories of Dutch colonization, because the Dutch treat people from Suriname and the Dutch Antilles in very different ways than let's say people from Indonesia. And like that kind of like also has such a big part in how far that assimilation process can go. So Indonesians, Indo, I should say, Indo-Dutch people weren't counted as allochtone. So they were somehow kept out of the official framework. And there was much more of a history of assimilation that was promoted by the Dutch state. Whereas if you were um, grew up in Suriname or Dutch Antilles under a Dutch colonial regime, your schooling would have been in Dutch, your passport would have been in du a Dutch passport, and, and yet you wouldn't be recognized as a Dutch um, subject, right? So I think there's this also, there's this real, colonial ongoing project. And it, this is definitely still a topic in the Netherlands where just for the first time, um, a black Surinamese woman has um, made it into parliament. And it's like the first black woman who's leading a political party in 2021, um, who made it, it with one seat into parliament, right? And, but to think about the larger context of colonialism and the histories of the Dutch, um, in relationship to Suriname, like that, that's such a major thing. Um, and for those conversations to still be part of the political agenda, I think also really brings up that question of like, in, in which ways is, is assimilation really a choice and for who is that choice being made? And then how do those complicated histories of racialization and racial hierarchies play into that? And I think part of what the BMR movement was trying to do is to say like, okay, we feel like we need we need some umbrella term to organize, but we're not necessarily interested in erasing difference because we can see that we need to kind of like figure out who we are to each other. So the fact that like Moroccan women said like, okay, we're gonna organize an evening for other women to come, women, other women of color to come and we can tell them about what the issues are in our Moroccan community or for Hindustani Surinamese women to say like, oh, we need to address our histories of anti-blackness with Afro Surinamese women. And none of those projects are finished and none of that needs to be like kind of romanticized. But I do think it comes down to that work within like feminist and queer communities of color of really kind of addressing those hierarchies because otherwise we absolutely get positioned in terms of our proximity to whiteness, our colonial histories, our histories of labor migration. Um, and I think those histories of scapegoating within the Dutch, but definitely also European context really show how, how that has played out. Yeah, Chandra, that was, a, yeah, your comments about sort of language and the use of language as sort of an, 
assimilationist tool by the state or whomever is also very interesting. And you see a similar dynamic, I think, in terms of German in, in Germany, in terms of Bio-Deutsch, um, which is supposed to be like, you know, biological um, German where you're like, okay, are they organic? But, you know, because, <laughs> um, but it's like bio, bio Deutsch and then um, uh, Migraten in Migraten. Migrationshintergrund, so a migration background, um, meaning like that's a German with like a migrant background, so not really a German. Um, <laughs> so, but that's the implication, not really a German, even though they're like third, fourth generation. Um, so you see that language circulating in the German context too. And I think that's why, you know, in terms of thinking about my own work, why I think Black German activism of the 80s and 90s was doing exactly pushing against that, um, that imposition of, uh, of a narrative that imposition of an, uh, an other an othered identity, and so they're really claiming um, a black identity, an Afro German identity, to sort of um, challenge that erasure and to challenge this ass assumption that Germany is, you know, raceless. It has, you know, racism doesn't exist, and they're like, no, it's like this. Our sheer existence um, queers normative understandings of of Germanness, and we're going to show you why. Um, so I think that's really a, an interesting thing to, to think about. I don't want to yak away, so I'll just... You can yak away in that way anytime, Tiffany. All right, I'm looking to, I'm checking everywhere. Okay. I have a question in the Q&A. During the keynote, one of our speakers mentioned deconnecting European American slash descendants of settler colonizers from the identity of white and reestablishing a connection with the Europeanness of their ancestry. I'm wondering how we converse or dismantle whiteness without undermining or ignoring the work being done to uplift historically oppressed groups. That may be me again. <laughs> um, if anyone else wants to jump in, I'm still processing. Okay. Um, I think whiteness studies in Germany is still um, still coming along. Um, I think the first book about whiteness studies in the German context was published in like 2005. So, I mean, that says it all in terms of thinking. Whereas here in the US, in terms of cultural studies, we have 90s as like a starting point for like how we see whiteness constructed. Um, in the German context, it's like decades later. Um, and I think there's still an inability for other scholars to see the significance of um, constructions of whiteness. So the book was published by like a, a variety of like um, German women of color, as well as sort of one white German woman, I think, and sort of thinking about whiteness in the German context, a super whiteness, um, sort of this notion of a super whiteness, which I mentioned earlier, emerges in this book um, by Maisha Uma, who talks about um, um, how Germany maintains this super whiteness. So I think it's important to talk about the um, about whiteness as a constructed category, much like we talk about race, much like we talk about blackness. They're not only constructed categories, but they evolve based on different um, times and spaces. Um, and I don't think like for, for black Germans in particular, um, they're not necessarily sort of avoiding their white family members. Um, so, you know, some of them are biracial, um, um, are biracial, and so they are not necessarily disconnecting from their white ancestry. Um, they identify as German and Black, and so they do, they do see the significance of, um, of those identities. Um, and then I think for them, it's not about um, a negation of whiteness as much as this sort of really talking about the negation of Blackness in the German context, mm -hmm. in which Blackness had no space. Um, to exist as an empowering um, and gentle um, uh, sort of uh, empowering figure. Um, and so I think for, for Black Germans, it's not necessarily a negation of, um, of whiteness, but there is a, a sort of critique and challenge of white supremacy um, and the power that white supremacy holds even within the German context. Um, and so I think part of their work, as well as other sort of Black European sort of Afropean groups is challenging this notion of the racelessness of Europe. You know, we see this back in the day with Stuart Hall's work, um, which she's talking about this. And so they're really keen on sort of talking about like, look, race is, has material impacts 
look at our experiences and we need to engage with those material impacts. So it's not necessarily like whiteness is bad, blackness is good. It's a bit more complex than that. Um, and I think that's what they're trying to sort of get at. But there are hands up, so I'll be quiet now. Thank you, Tiffany. I'm delighted to call on you, Manuela, as yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I had raised my hand before Tiffany's last comment, so uh, she already covered most of what I wanted to say, but what I um, was thinking about was um, differentiating between whiteness as a um, political positionality and whiteness as um, kind of attached label. So when, when um, Tiffany says, you know, um, some of these um, people who um, have anti-racist projects and um, kind of are engaged in anti-racist struggle, do not disengage from their white family members. Um, it is not, it is only kind of an ascribed whiteness that they do not disengage from. But I think um, a politically assumed whiteness or whiteness as a political positionality would be very much something that um, anti-racist um, struggles would dissociate from. So I, I made it too convoluted. What I meant, meant to say is that um, whiteness is a political positioning first and foremost, uh, while it can also be um, attributed through kind of um, a definition between who's white, who's black. But as a political positioning, it can be dissociated from and it can be deconstructed. And I think that's what we should aim for to um, kind of disentangle and deconstruct um, the attractiveness of um, claiming whiteness um, and making it the desirable way to be or the norm or the um, standard or the um, measure um, to which or the standard up to which we are being measured. Um, and as long as it's no longer attractive um, because it is not um, what it is associated with desirability, wealth or um, power, then it is a way of deconstructing it without just denying it or rejecting it. I don't know, I hope I made some sense. Manuel, I think you made a, sorry, I'm just jumping in again. Um, you made a great point um, in terms of thinking about, um, you know, deconstructing or de-empowering whiteness. Um, but it's so indexed to anti-blackness and anti-indigenousness that it's so, I mean, that's the, I mean, it's normative because of that. Like those are the, those are the ways that it's able to sustain itself um, in which it continues to sort of evolve in interesting ways. But I also find it striking in terms of thinking about like the sort of um, recent anti-Asian, um, anti Asian racism in the US as well as in the globe, across the globe, quite honestly, in Europe as well. Um, that, you know, discussions about the model, model, uh, model minority myth have, you know, been coming up and people are like, whoa, whoa, what about that? And that's indexed to like anti-Blackness and anti-Indigenousness. Um, that's why it functions as a myth. Um, and that's why it's had this sort of power for so long. Um, so I, I, I think there's some, there's, you're right. They're like, we need to like deconstruct um, whiteness. And I think anti-racist -activi anti activism is not only sort of trying to tackle, you know, this sort of the enduring power and allure of whiteness, but also trying to dismantle the systems that obtain, that you know, maintain this allure of, um, of whiteness. Um, I mean, it feels like, it feels like a, a slow process in terms of like this ongoing process of doing this. But I think that's part of this activism, the activism that Chandra's talking about, the activism that many of us are also talking about, the legal um, pushes against this type of, um, of discrimination, I think all function in that way. Can I jump in and, and, and tag piggyback off of something that Tiffany said? And so we have many students, uh, many of our students on the Zoom, and they've heard this already, but, um, you know, you know, the, the model minority myth, which is something, you know, we've made reference to here and there, you know, it's, you know, I mean, it's a example of racial triangulation that's used to write up to sort of um, uphold white supremacy and at this and also to uphold uh, anti-black racism and anti-indigenous um, 
racism isn't the right word, but you, you know what I mean? So it's like, um, you know, those myths, as you said, Tiffany, those mythologies, which they are, exist for a reason. Um, and I, you know, it reminded me um, that I, I got an email early this morning about, um, you know, these affirmative action lawsuits that Asian Americans are filing against, you know, these elite Ivy League schools, which, you know, make me sick to my stomach. But I mean, um, really interestingly, um, someone pointed out that the, the lawsuit that is now being, Yale is now uh, been targeted and, and uh, being sued by a group of Asia, uh, Asian Americans challenging the affirmative action policy. In the complaint, I believe, um, they have excluded, the Asian American plaintiffs have excluded by definition from Asian American, Southeast Asians, Hmong, Cambodian, uh, you know, and it and it's just, it blew my mind to even see that blatant of a of a sort of sub sub racialization. You know what I mean? I mean it. What it, it, it's you know I need to think about it more, but I just wanted to to reference it as like sort of triangulation within triangulation. It's it's really stunning how how that can work. I've had a couple of people make comments in the chat, which I want to invite them if they want to bring them more generally to the conversation to do that at this time. But if not, they might have meant them to be more in the chat. Don't want to put anybody on the spot. Um, very quickly, I just wanted to add on before the moment is lost that thinking about naming, right, and this idea of even Asian American and what is Asian American and uh, Jeanine talked about what is African American and so the names and thinking about this as being sort of trapped within our colonial terminologies for ourselves and what does this mean. Right, right. and there is even a movement, a uh, very nation movement of, of um, tr people trying to convince to drop Pacific Islander from the sort of rights from the classification of Asian American or Asian Pacific Americans because exactly because of that right um, because it's it's a reference a very explicit reference to colon you know colonization um, even though you know most people think it's more progressive to call um, Asian Americans Asian Pacific Americans <laughs> so yeah. All right, I'm going, we have just a couple minutes left and I'm going to throw this out here. And if we don't have uh, responses at this point, we'll take them um, after and, and send them out. But um, Emily and I are in the process of teaching a capstone class this semester, which we're loving. Um, we're calling it Intersectional Stories. We limited it to 10 students who have either taken her critical race theory class or my feminist legal theory class, many of them have taken both, um, with the idea that when we both get to the second half of our classes, when in our opinions, um, both of those uh, areas have properly adopted intersectionality, they overlap and we have some of our favorite stories that we both have to like, are you teaching it this semester or can I teach it? Um, and are doing that right now. And we had a request um, from a couple of our students to offer an international perspective on some of these issues. And we were like, funny, you should ask that because we're gonna have exactly the right group to, um, so what we chose are some of our law review articles that have narratives because um, part of what we're talking about is the power of narrative. And um, Karui, you were talking earlier about the power of language and narrative. Um, so if you have any scholarship in your areas that have you know particular narratives that really bring out the complexities of a point i mean that's one of the things i think is so powerful about narratives and poetry um, especially in the world of law where everyone wants everything stripped off so people can spot the legal issue and get all the complexities out narratives insist on 
um, what we all have to grapple with. There are no easy answers. Um, nothing is, uh, you have to embrace the complexity to get anywhere near something that would be just closer to um, belonging, what we might like. So if any of you have any of those um, pieces to suggest to our audience or that we can take back to our students, um, the areas in which you're working are just so uh, fascinating and we would just love any narratives that you might have to share. Can we email these to you, Kristen? Yes, you may, and we'll get them to the we'll get them to the group because I'm sure they will be excellent suggestions. Does anyone have anything that they did not have an opportunity to talk about or share today? I just want to say thank you to all of you. It's such a rare rare circumstance where we're not just all talking to each other, <laughs> right? Or talking at each other and really just having these conversations in vacuum. So thank you so much for taking the time and for sharing your work with us all today. Thank you for the invitation. And it was, a, it was great. It was, yeah. I feel energized and I have to like teach a class in half an hour, but I still feel energized. <laughs> The same. I mean, this is it's so wonderful and it's great to uh, this interdisciplinary format is is really, really rich uh, and especially thinking, you know, I haven't had a, an actual peripheral race uh, class, you know, now it's been over like a decade and some change, and, but just in terms of where I'm, I was actually reading, you know, I, you know, legal theory. Uh, and so I appreciate being reacquainted with uh, these techniques and sort of like these technologies uh, because it re reminds me uh, of that discourse itself um, is uh, has very real uh, impacts and um, and and so there's something about that where that sometimes and the worlds that I travel some things can feel uh, kind of abstract uh, I like that but I also like to see uh, um, how we can actually use language and how language is used, um, you know, to create policy uh, and, and these ways that that I'm like, okay, this is this is really important. I should know this. I should I should learn more about this. So thank you all uh, for uh, for the opportunity to to share and learn. Thank we'll you. add this a couple really of our own intersectional stories to the list yep. <laughs> well i just want to finally add i don't know when this is going to end but um what create that thank you for that and i just want to say that you know i want to come back to something i said earlier about aspiring to amateurism you know i think sometimes when we're in our fields we're so afraid we're we're so afraid to talk to across disciplines right because we're worried that we won't understand each other because of the of the technical terms that we use because of the particular technologies and methods that are used in our fields. Um, and one thing that this conference has shown me is that there is nothing to fear um, in having these kinds of conversations. There may be things that we don't understand, but that's okay. Um, you aspire, you know, as Saeed said, again, it's great to, you know, I keep bringing him up, but aspiring to amateurism is 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 really necessary to sort of get to justice um, you know and I so I thank all of you for um, for being here it's been great okay that that's a wrap <laughs> so thank and, you thank oh, you so much thank you and once again we want to thank Bill Morelli for making this possible um, it's it's just great that that you know you're you know he's he's given us a really free reign to sort of like yeah. have these conversations and it that is so appreciated and uh thank you all um for being here <laughs>